Women Matters, again and again and again, and I'm so glad that you are here. Uh, we are in March 23, and we want to talk about change. And before that, we start with a, a change of season, and this was a topic before, and I give word to you, Haneli, and do it so check in a little bit and so on. <laughs> Thank you, Heidi. Hello, everyone. I'm here in Cape Town, and my name is Hanali, and I'm delighted to be here with the ladies again after a few weeks. <laughs> uh, the change of season this year really got me. I've never gotten sick like this in my life before. So with the change of season here from Johannesburg to Cape Town, there it's very gradual. You know, it's very subtle, actually, in, you know, on that part of South Africa. But here in Cape Town, it's very windy. And because of that, the changes very quickly. And we had very, very hot days, still a very cold one. So to just to acclimatize takes a little bit longer than I thought it would happen. But it's also strange. I was here at the same time four years ago, and I didn't experience it like this. So I don't know if it's the global weather changes that impacts it, because we've had lots and lots of floods in Johannesburg and other parts of the country. So in terms of change, yes, for me, it was also a big change to come down to Cape Town and um, still getting used to all of that as well. I'm very good with change, generally speaking. I just go with whatever is happening. Uh, but this time around, it's a bit different. I don't know why. It's really interesting. If I sense into it, um, I suppose this part, yeah, this part of me that, yeah, is still resisting. I don't know why because I love traveling, I love to go to different places. And um, yes, there is lots of change happening in the world, in technology, for in the financial industry, like you just said, Heidi, with banks, um, instability everywhere. And I think we've, I felt that we've been prepared for it. Uh, with whatever is happening, we're preparing for something that's going to happen in the future. That's how I felt in the last three, four years of what was happening globally with the pandemic, the Ukraine-Russian war, um, migration issues and climate change, flood cyclones, earthquakes, all those type of things. And the other financial thing and also unemployment in the workplace. And for me, what was a shock is I was witness to how people treat each other in the formal workplace. And I haven't been part of that world for a long time. So it was quite a shock for me to see how people treat each other and how they will climb on top of each other just to get to the top. So that was a quite a big surprise for me. I think that's why it takes me a bit longer here to get used to um, the environment. So it was both a gift, but also quite a challenge to be witnessing that, to be you know, in many different ways, to be able to be present to what's really happening in there because I was a bit secluded from that for the last 10 years. So thank you, I'm complete and I'll pass on to Beatrice. Hi everybody. Um, I really do not like daylight savings time. It always throws me for a loop and makes me extra tired and I've been extra tired already, so <laughs> made it worse. Um, I'm still in New York. I'm here for another week. Um, this weekend, we had our first showing, sharing of the project I'm working on, The Morning Machine, and it went really well. Um, it all came together. I, you know, a few days before, I wasn't sure that we had enough. I didn't, it didn't feel like we were ready to, to share anything, but people were coming and, and it was just amazing to watch the whole team come together um, on Saturday and, and make the space, can completely transform the space we were in and um, create this experience. And we got a lot of positive feedback this week. We're gonna work on um, a feedback form to send out to everybody and hear more about what they, what they experienced. Um, and, and so that's, the project isn't done, but that's the reason I was here. And so this is kind of, we've come to the conclusion of this particular chapter. Um, and then we'll keep working and see what comes next. Um, 
also this weekend, I didn't actually realize it last yesterday, um, one of my collaborators actually reminded me that um, this weekend was the three year anniversary of my thesis show. And that, that actually feels very appropriate because this project feels like like the new the new life and new form and kind of evolution of that project. Um, except this time I get to do it bigger and with more people and collaboratively. And um, there are elements of my thesis show that have made it made their way into into this project and and will probably continue to do so. So it's it's nice to reflect on that. I can't believe it's been three years. <laughs> Um, time goes by really quickly and it also feels a very, a very long time ago. Um, what else is going on? Yeah. So I think I'm just, and now I'm trying to catch up on everything else. Um, I had to kind of put things on hold the last few weeks while I focused on this. Um, the other big thing that's been going on that I cried about for four days last week was, uh, my grandmother's house, the one that we spent a number of days in, in December to clear out the things um, has been put up for sale and by the fiduciary. And if we want to keep it, we have to make a bid on it and we have to outbid the other people. Um, so anyway, I think my mother and I will talk about that privately after this call, but um, we're trying to figure out what, what to do and, and, it's a house that I spent a lot of time in as a child um, every holiday and and lived there for a while too when we first moved to San Diego. And I also stayed with my grandparents a lot when I was in school. Um, and it's been in the family for generations and generations, but it's, a, it's kind of falling down. And I know that if somebody else buys it, they're gonna destroy it. Like I, I, I have no doubt. Um, that it'll be turned into condominiums or something really ugly. And and I had this dream of turning it into an artist space or transforming it in some way. And it's really, it's really heartbreaking to see it falling apart. Um, so anyway, it's, it's, but I also, you know, I don't know that I want to commit to that, that project or that work right now. So anyway, that's, that's the other big thing that's been weighing on me and I've been trying to give myself space to to grieve the house and to remember everything that happened there and um yeah so those are the two big things um practical examples of change yep <laughs> <laughs> um I'll pass to my mother thank you um, yeah, I, a lot of change, um, a, a, a sort of a symbol of change was that, uh, last week, one of my favorite people in the world, um, died. It, it was not a surprise because he was 91 years old, but it was also a surprise because he seemed immortal. <laughs> um, he was an Italian Barnabite uh, priest from Milano, who was sent by his superiors to the United States when he was, um, I think, just after he was ordained. So he spent most of his life um, here. And the last part of it, he was various places in the United States, but the last decades were here in San Diego at the Italian National Parish. And um, he, he, embodied everything that's fabulous about the Italians. <laughs> I'm sure you know what I mean, Heidi. And um, he he was just wonderful. And I mean, really wonderful. I, the, people were talking at the, at the funeral, reception for the funeral that um, people who knew him really well, that they think he's going to be made a saint, but it doesn't matter. I mean, he's, he was a saint to everybody that he met. He was just totally full of love and he was very fierce, but also incredibly loving and um even to strangers he had this beautiful beautiful nature um and it was interesting because it was it was um it had been a number of years since i had spent time 
with uh, a body in the, in an open coffin because that's not the fashion anymore. Um, you, most services are memorial services, and at most there's an urn with the ashes, but sometimes there's nothing. Um, and um, anyway, it, I don't know. I'm still I'm still sort of in that space. Is the space of total total peace and total rest and this kind of beauty. I don't know. It was um, anyway. I, I won't talk anymore about it. But it but that that for me is is sort of the overarching thing that's happened recently. And um, I'm going to dedicate my concert tomorrow night to him. Um, I asked if I could play at the church. I had always promised to play a concert for him and, um, but it never worked out. And so, um, and I even tried to play at the funeral and they wouldn't let me. Um, and anyway, I've, I've been in a rage all morning because they, they refused to tell, the people in the church refused to tell the parishioners that I'm dedicating my concert to him tomorrow night, um, which I think is very unfair. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, but I, yeah, and I mean, if change is the topic, I think I think I'm in a position to think about a lot of change <laughs> in the world. Um, I mean, the big thing that that it, it fits right into my Buddhist studies, but I'll talk about that later. So, um, but that's my check, and it's it sort of took over my whole week, um, even more than my concert last week. So. That's my check in. I will pass to Monia. Yeah. Um, yeah. The weather <laughs> in Vienna is, we had lots of wind, storm. It's still snowing in the west and melting right away. And the birds and the squirrels on our balcony are just they are greedy they whenever I put something out nuts they are there right away and just vacuum it off so maybe it's getting colder again I don't know uh, the topic of change yeah well in my age actually you don't like change um, houses are torn down just two streets from our house. Uh, shops are closed. Many shops are closed. Um, yeah, and of course, the health, our health isn't mine and my husband's isn't the top anymore. So we are, he's seeing quite a few doctors every week. And yeah, I had a, a very clear dream last night. Uh, and there was one sentence in English <laughs> because I read a lot of English fantasy books right now. And the sentence is, compassion is the key. So uh, I, I Googled it and there are already books about that. Comp that compassion is the key for self-love and love of others. And so this is maybe something I use as a beacon in all the changes we are having now, right now, in Austria, in Europe, in the world. Uh, and of course, the war in the Ukraine is rather upsetting. Everybody, we have lots of fugitives who plan to stay here. Luckily, they are rather well educated. But of course, we have lots of uh, migrants from Afghanistan, for example, who don't fit in at all. So it's, it's really a shame. And to learn German is difficult. Yeah, so wherever I look, there are changes and you just have to be careful and to be sterilized in yourself because everything else is just changing all the time. Heidi, I'll pass on to you. Yeah, uh, thank you. 
I had a com an email exchange with Christine King, and she tries to come in, uh, but um, this <laughs> so it seems to to have changed Zoom. She says she cannot she cannot come in, and I don't know why. So that's that's say maybe a change by the technology or who knows. So my own um, story. I have quite a few people around at the moment and very active and very active. This morning I worked at least five or six hours outside and afterwards I was really tired, you know, lawn, uh, mowing the lawn and painting and, and then I also cut roses and all these little things which need to be done, but I feel quite energized by doing this work and also because there's a friend here and she is really busy helping me and also her husband and this is sort of uplifting then I do more too because when I'm alone the everything alone yesterday we did huge fires because uh, of the um, olive tree cutting I did the last tree in this part of the uh, of the land and then we had a big two big fires and then we grilled uh, some sausages and bistecca, no? <laughs> and it's so good on the olive, you know, and on the olive wood. That's, you don't need salt, you don't need anything. It's so tasty. So it was a nice day. And today, yeah, I felt like continue to do something. So it's good. I'm fine. The change is the season. Today was the first day which I thought it's really spring. It, I, it was quite warm in the sun hot, but I saw in the in the provisions that it might go down. I I unpacked the the here that you see on the picture the the lemon tree in the back this white thing. I unpacked it this morning, but maybe I have to put for some night. I have to put it in again. Do you see it in the on the back of the flowers? In winter, I have to pack them because they uh, um, these trees in our area here wouldn't wouldn't keep. So the change towards spring, I love it really. And I with, because you said the how is it called the summertime in in English? This change of time. Now you are what in what time? What is it called in English? Daylight savings time. Daylight saving time. I, I really like it. And for at least a week, I'm already in the rhythm of it. I go to bed earlier and wake uh, wake up earlier. So I already live it. And we do it only in two weeks. So next time we meet, then it will be like normal. No confusion, nothing. So good. This is also a change. Time change. <laughs> Okay, so as Christine doesn't seem to, to make it, let's talk about change. In the pre-room, Monia, you talked about resistance, and also Haneli, you talked about resistance. I think, yeah, every new thing has this component no, of a little, uh, but it's also good, isn't it good to, to be careful and not to just jump in from the cliff, let's say, no? I open it to you, whatever considerations you have. Yeah, thank you, Heidi. Um, yeah, for we, we don't have daylight savings time. So we, <laughs> for us, there's no change of it. We just need to align ourselves with the rest of the world. So ourselves, it stays the same. So it's wonderful. So it's always been very interesting for us, this change. But you remind me now of a few years back, a friend of mine from Austria, was going to come to South Africa in September. So it would be in your autumn and our spring. And literally a week before he was supposed to fly, already had his ticket, everything was booked. I arranged lots of workshops for us. Um, and But a week before he came, he said he, he, he can't do it anymore because he, he realized that for him to make that switch in his mind, to come back from your summer, to suddenly spring again, where it would be autumn in Europe, he could he, he was going to struggle. He said his mind would stop him. So 
what, what it leads me to is that our mind sometimes, I think, is the resistor, not so much the body necessarily. It's our perceptions. And uh, I was obviously devastated at the time because we would have seen, go and see how the whales, because in that time of the year, the whales come close to the beach. And it's just beautiful to watch the whales. And we had book tickets booked to go to a whale festival. But I could, I did understand why I was resistant. And from a body perspective, when we do embodiment work, the word resistance, we break it down. It's re, in English, re, I stance. So I must show up, I must show up in a different stance, in a different position. And then the body resists beyond even the mind. The body keeps us back, holds us back. And a lot of the time people are able to do a paradigm shift. So the way they think about something, a mindset, but the body then feels it's unsafe. It's not used to that situation. So it will resist. And that's why we need to work on a body, mind, heart connection level when we deal with change and not just trying to do a paradigm shift, but also a sense shift that the body can feel comfortable with this new idea and get used to it. And we see it many, many times in many parts of business, communities and the likes that most beautiful views of something they, they want to uh, embrace change, but then it's like one part holds them back. And in my experience, it's mostly then the body because we haven't really attended to that part at all. We never learned really to embrace change on that level. But it's actually natural for us because from a child, we develop all the time, our bodies change. And yes, it's not always easy, especially into, you know, when we're like 10, 11, 12 years old for the body to adapt to these new ways. But we've gone through it, so it's not new to our bodies to change. And um, as we grow older, the body changes as well. So it's, for me, it, the entry point is always the mind, to work on the mind. And why, are the, why is the mind resistant? But so thank you for bringing that up. I'm complete for now. Um, I just remembered one of um, one of my new gurus, <laughs> um, but it, it, I stumbled on him quite by accident. But this is fabulous old African American man, and um, he, he's about the age of what Martin Luther King would be now. He's really ancient, and he knew Martin Luther King and all that that whole. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. But he said that. Um, his wife says because they teach together, which is also very refreshing. Um, she says, nobody likes change except a wet baby. <laughs> so just to bring in a little bit of levity, <laughs> Hanali really likes it. <laughs> you should have, you should have your, you should have your volume on so we can hear you laugh. <laughs> It'll cheer us up. <laughs> anyway, I thought that was a nice note of levity. <laughs> <laughs> that is that's so I must note it down, Victoria. That's absolutely magic during a change workshop. <laughs> to to because it's it's classic. <laughs> well, it puts everything in perspective. And um yeah. And I on a on a very serious note, um he he said something that that I have been doing ever since I I um heard his talk, that he said that um he starts every day before he gets out of bed with the five remembrances, um, which are, um, I, there it's the Buddhist five remembrances. Number one is I am of the nature to grow old. And number two is I'm the, of the nature to become sick. I, re, I like to reverse them because I figure you can get sick before you get old. But anyway, that's, that's neither here nor there. Um, I am of the nature to die. Um, everything and everybody I love, I will lose. And then the very last one, um, which is, you know, supposed to, well, I mean, if you haven't killed yourself by the time you've gone through those, <laughs> the last one is supposed to energize you. The only thing I am heir to, um, is my own karma. So I translate that into, um, because I don't believe in karma in the way that they do. I, but I translate it into my own actions. I'm, I'm responsible for my own actions in my life, for my own choices, for my own decisions. 
And that's that's pretty much it because all these other things are, everything else is impermanent. And well, I, I'm impermanent too, but that's the only thing where I have agency. I can't control whether I get old or not. I can't control whether I get sick. I mean, to an extent I can, and I certainly can't control whether I die. So he says he's, he says those and meditates on them every morning before he gets out of bed. And I've been doing it. Uh, well, this morning I didn't. Maybe that's why I'm in bad shape today. <laughs> but um, it, it's really, it's strange. I thought it would be very morbid. I thought it was a horrible way to start your day. But it's actually really wonderful because it's liberating. It, it, it's like it, it just like clears the slate and you can just have your day and do the things that you want to do and need to do and just move forward knowing that that's all you have anyway. So why worry about all these other things? And um, and then at night, um, I haven't tried this yet. It sounds very um, exhausting, but maybe Beatrice should try. <laughs> um, he, he does 108 deep breaths. 108, of course, is the sacred Buddhist number. Um, and so he counts 108. And if he's still awake, which he said he usually isn't, um, then he'll he'll do start another set going backwards but um i don't know if he has insomnia or what but but anyway i haven't tried that yet but i love the um the five remembrances so i just wanted to share that because it's it, i don't know ever since i heard him say that it's it it's changed my perspective in a kind of a real way it's not just intellectual so that's my share and but i like the baby's part even better <laughs> I think even the wet baby sometimes resists. Speak for yourself. Well, you did. That's true. <laughs> you would keep your diaper even if you had it for the rest of your life. You were very resistant. May I ask a question to you, Beatrice? I'm curious, how do you personally in your generation experience a change, no matter the time? How does my generation experience change? <laughs> Often in this room, I feel like I'm the, the representative and I don't feel like well equipped to be the representative. Um, do you, are, is there a more specific question there or is it, or just in general? Just in general, you know, um, let me give you, let me just take one step back to explain. When I was your age, we lived at a time when humanity was quite stable, status, you know, there was not a lot of change going on. Everybody followed the same type of pattern. There was not really stuff disruptions like we're experiencing currently in the world. And obviously that impact on, uh, on older people then who've been here longer on, let me rather say that, uh, on how they perceive change. So you get a lot of resistance, usually with a lot with older people. But because the younger generations have been born into all these rapid changes that's happening one on the other, I was just curious in general, as a generation, how do you feel your perception of it when you look at your friends and your peers, your co-workers um, with a similar age, maybe younger, what you perceive their experience of change is? Hmm. That's interesting. I mean, I still perceive resistance, but but there is there's also a kind of freedom um you know it's it's rare for anyone to stick to one career or one job these days um you know you do a, you do a job for a couple of years and then you shift gears and do something else or people are shifting careers even you know decades after working in something and and there's there's people, you know, people will just get up and move and live somewhere else. Or um, there's, there's, you know, discoveries of identity or, or kind of unraveling maybe self-perception and kind of figuring out how you actually want to be in the world or what actually makes the most sense to you. Um, 
So I think it's, I think it's both. It's, there's definitely, there's definitely kind of a freedom and a choice and a, and a, you know, if things are falling apart, there's, there's, I think there's always this voice that's like, well, there's another, there's another path somewhere. There's another option somewhere, or, you know, there's a lot of conversation about, you know, famous people who didn't actually get successful until they were older or they had how many, you know, terrible drafts that got rejected before. <laughs> I see that messaging a lot of, of, you know, Walt Disney's first film getting turned down from a major studio or whatever. And the idea being that there's always, there's always going to, there's always an opportunity, even if it feels like late, it's never too late. Um, that being said, I think there's also a yearning for stability. Um, it's very hard for my generation to buy a house unless they have family help. Um, it's very hard to be able to stay in one place, to live in one place because of financial things and things shifting in the economy constantly and and losing jobs. I mean, because things are changing so much, it's it's very hard to stick to one thing and stick to one place if you want to, and that's a challenge. And I think there is a yearning for stability and a yearning for solidness. And I think often where that shows up is in trying to build community and trying to find your people and trying to band together. Um, so they're still resistant. Nobody likes change. <laughs> But I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I can't, I mean, obviously I don't know what the experience is like to be in a different generation. Um, and I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that, 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 you know, we've, we've, we've grown up and, and are continuing to grow up in a world that is shifting constantly. And I haven't really thought about that, but it's true. And it certainly colors the experience. I mean, it's also kind of exhausting, to be honest, you know, um, and fun. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think it depends on where you are and what you're doing, but it, it it really it really has this kind of I was gonna say duality, but it's more than duality. It really has a spectrum of experience. The question is how do we address that change? Resistance normally uh you you lose a lot of energy, a lot of, of, of you know. But can you can you be in a change process without resistance? And how would you if you initially had resistance, how would you give it up? I mean do you have any experiences in this? Uh, or any tips or any something well what i have been wondering since the last speech of our federal chancellor about the future of austria and he said um not every progress is uh good or is a successful step but to set to step back or to have a setback is never felt as positive, uh, as a positive development. So we have been, at least my generation, always has uh, equalized change with progress. Things are getting faster, better, uh, easier to be handled. And now all of a sudden it's, there is, uh, yeah, people said, well, we don't have to grow and industry doesn't have to grow all the time. So maybe we can just set, do less, buy less, uh, do less shopping. And of course, now that people have no job as Beatrice, 
mention it, and it's also the younger generation who is looking for jobs. That's a kind of change uh, that's not felt, that is positive from the beginning. Uh, my generation had so many changes, uh, starting with even the telephone, what the telephone is like. I mean, it's just, uh, I remember when we had one apparatus on, on the wall, it was a box and you just had a quarter of the whole. So you shared it with three other people and you could hear that when somebody else called you get tatak, 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 and then uh, you could call or you could call. But nobody uh, really found that very, we were just great that it, we had a telephone at all. And uh, and I just I got that one of these uh, funny funny uh, what changed in our lives and we had change all the time all the time uh, and of course our going to the United States and living there and the children born there. You had to adapt all the time. You didn't know what kind of coffee to use or what kind of detergent to buy. And that was sort of, yeah, it was like an adventure. But coming back to Austria, um, there was, uh, as, as uh, Beatrice said, there was a lot more of stability and you could rely on things. And what it's now, it's you sort of have a feeling that you can't rely on anything anymore because uh, tomorrow it will be different. Or uh, as you said, somebody loses his job or gets sick. So it's, Yeah, does change always mean transformation in a positive way? That's the problem. Or that's the, the challenge, let's put it like this positively. That's the challenge is change equal transformation or can you just avoid transformation and change? You can't. Whenever you, whenever you change, you are different, so it's, It's a hard decision to make. Of course, there is the saying, uh, the Indian saying, Ganesha, uh, whenever a door closes, another door opens. I'm not sure. That's it. So we'll, we'll, we're trying to make the best of it, of the economic situation and of the climate situation. But, uh, thinking of our industries, ski industries. So much of our business in Austria, it depends on snow. And when there is no snow, what do you do? Um, so people have to get creative. And if they, if they resist getting creative, it's getting difficult. But being creative is maybe one of the sources you can go with the flow of time. Yeah, that's about what, what comes to me with change. I wanted to step in here because also my life was completely uh, with change, but change which we perceived as exciting and good because there was telephone and then it was this and that and then first a bicycle and then you could have a car and all these things and all the 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 electrical tools for the kitchen you know washing machine I remember my mother finally had a washing machine and didn't have to go down three staircases to the cellar and heat the 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 the, the big uh, thing for for washing and so on so it seemed to be really in service of of us 
also, especially for women, no? it is so much easier, dishwashers and everything. And um, now it seems to happen that the change is not serving our, let's say, progress, our, our, it's not, doesn't seem to serve us personally anymore, but it seems to ask us, uh, now you have to go back to the state where you were 50 years ago, more or less, you know, and this is a different quality of, of, of change. As long as change is transformation into you know, something, oh, good, I always wanted to do this, and now I can use the air, airplanes no when the, the the air fees were so cheap and you could go everywhere i know and it was really exciting but now for one reason or other you shouldn't fly you don't fly you cannot fly uh, for instance no so it seems like a restriction a change into into lack into into something which is missing and so emotionally it's completely different it's also changed, but it's not not the same thing. And then with this instability, we were sure that everything is going on like this, you know, it was very stable. And now, oh, how is the future? Even, you know, we thought the war has gone. We never would have any war again, and at least not nearby. And, uh, and now you think, oops, maybe, oh, you cannot know. So this sort of change is psychologically heavy, in my opinion. So how can we deal with it? Simple. Um, <laughs> I'm going to step back onto my preaching box. Um, no, I, I think that's it's great the way you portrayed it, Heidi, because it's very it makes it very, very clear. And also what Monia said that I think um, it's it's clear that if you put your trust and your reliance on material things or not necessarily material in the sense of like consumerism, but just material in the sense of all, all, all that that implies in terms of your your physical life, then you're bound to um, have to adjust constantly to to changes because things are and 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 things are moving more and more rapidly all the time i mean um i have friends that were wizards on the internet and now they're totally lost because nothing that they know how to do is valid anymore and every time you buy something um everything's planned now with with, with planned obsolescence so you buy a phone that you can plug in with a certain kind of a cable and within a year, it's obsolete because they want you to buy a new phone, not just the cable, the new cable. And it's everything's designed now to be moving faster and faster and um, changing faster. And so the I, I think that's why, like for me, these five remembrances have been such a gift because it's like it's like it raises you out of this total chaos and turmoil and where everything's coming at you all the time and everything's changing and happening. And you're in this, and I guess that's what I experienced looking at this, the, 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 the body of this priest, this incredible sense of like, they're in this other sphere, however you conceive of it, whether it's, you know, overtly spiritual or just philosophical or, um, or even if it's nothingness, you know, I mean, the, the, the classical Buddhists don't even believe in, in afterlife or anything. There's just all a void. But whatever it is, it's this sense that you can, you're you're not just being pushed and pulled all the time. And I think when Mo, in Monia, your dream, the compassion is the key. I think that's also true, because if we're down here on our level, where we do have influence and we do we can be responsible for every move we make, if we if we make compassion the the key then these little tiny interactions are significant. And we see that, that every minute of our lives, we're making, we can make a difference if we want to, just to wave to a neighbor or send an email or pick up the phone or pet an animal. It's like, I were pick, or doing the gardening. The, the, um, I did some gardening yesterday and I thought, what a fantastic thing that I can help these poor little plants 
live. You know, their their life or death is is I'm responsible for it. I mean, it's too bad I don't have a gardener because I think they do better. But but this sense that you know you can even have compassion. You know, and that's the other thing that I like about Buddhism. Like all of a sudden, I'm not killing flies anymore. I'm like getting very creative, <laughs> like creativity, figuring out how to get the fly out of the house without killing it. So, but it's funny. It, it even it sounds ridiculous. And I in the beginning when I started all this, I I thought that these people were silly that were so into like you know don't step on the insect you know and but now I see um the value in it just for us even even selfishly even apart from like the value for the insects and the plants and the animals it makes us feel more connected and it makes us feel like our lives are not in vain and then all the change can happen in the world but on our little micro level on our little tiny piece of turf on the planet, we're making a difference, even if it's only in minuscule, minuscule increments. And I think that to me, that's what's what is keeping me sane right now. Well, we have a standard saying, my husband and I, any mosquito that comes into our apartment will have a very fast uh, reincarnation <laughs> and hopefully for the better. <laughs> Well, the Dalai Lama, the Dalai Lama has a great line. He said, if you feel that being, because people say, well, I'm, what can I do to help the world, the climate change and all the political stuff and the wars? And the Dalai Lama says, if you think that, that being small means that you're powerless, he said, spend one night in a room with a mosquito and you'll change your mind. <laughs> so that and the wet baby are my, my takeaways. <laughs> Yeah, Monja, both you, um, Heidi and you, Victoria, just thank you for what you just shared because it, you know, for me, in, I love you, you already started to be addressed with when you said the spectrum of experience. And I had a friend many, many years ago who said, whenever you're sick, why don't you, why do you complain that I feel, I'm not feeling well? Uh, why are you going getting depressed and like, why can't you just have fun while you're sick? Why can't you just see it for what it is? And, and because your soul was so brave to choose this experience as well, because of the richness of life, to experience all the spectrum of experiences, then your, your perception of change would change as well. Because, he, oh, but this is new. What is this? And there was, there was a, there's a Zand, uh, Ben Zandler. I just think of him now as well. You know, in Victoria, the, the, um, he was, he was um, directing the, Boston Philharmonic Orchestra. He was, is, he was in South Africa many years ago and I had the opportunity to see him. And um, the one thing that he said, if something strange is happening that's unsettling, just say, oh, that's fascinating. Because just by saying something like that, you distance yourself from it. So you don't have any emotional investment in it at first. So you can look for, at it from a distance. And in my experience, when when we resist, for example, we, we go into the experience and our awareness goes out of our body, away from us, to, that, to whatever is happening. So maybe like let's take another banks in the U.S. closing down, looking at it from a distance, there's discernment of, uh, possible, which both contains wisdom and compassion, but it's not having this emotional investment in it. So you're just looking at it. And in that way, the moment you create distance between yourself and whatever is happening, you can look at it with fresh perspectives. And then you can even try, you can even then challenge yourself to play with it, to see what will happen if I look at it this way. What maybe if I look at it that way, maybe if I put on that person's shoes and stand in their shoes, what would they experience? So both enrich your life, but it's also cognitive dissonance because you can hold all these experiences at once and it's a, and Beatrice, you brought up the word identification. And it's what you identify with and as that creates the resistance and the pain and the struggle and the suffering and the likes. So the more we can just take that step back. And then we've got this incredible creative potential and intelligence to create another type of circumstance and experience. And it brings me also back when you spoke about stability. Um, 
if we can just come back to our own core stability, which is inside of us, it's not something that's outside of us. It's not the things that we see around ourselves. And when we play with people, we assist them to experience on all four or five levels, physical, emotional, spiritual, mental, and physical. So in the body as well. And when you experience your core stability on all those levels, then there could be an earthquake around you and you'll be able to stay centered. It doesn't say that you won't go into fear because we're all human, but you, you, you will become less and less reactive to whatever is happening around yourself. And in that sense, then you contribute to a better place in the world because you are, your present moment awareness is now here within you, to your, connected to your own core, and you can then share love or uh, understanding or peace, or whatever is needed in a specific situation for everyone around you and for yourself. And that's really powerful to play with these two things, your own core stability and then your creative potential. Because in your mind, our minds love that to exercise that creative potential of what else is possible. Just by asking questions, is a, it's just a simple doorway that opens. And then we feel it also in all these other levels of, I can just come back to this equilibrium within me because it's not affected by what's going on in the world, but that doesn't mean I can't be compassionate. But then, then we don't get into a state of empathic overload because that's also not good. That will drain us. That will immediately drain us. And that's not good either. Then we have no service to anyone, neither to ourselves. And when we play with, we have, I've got a workshop that we've been doing in 2020 and 21 in the business world online. And it was called softening the edges of change. And then we took people through that process, but it's very playful. It's very creative. And I can't remember who, who said this quote or this who shared this wisdom, but it says, if you want to change people, make it fun. Make it fun for them to experience. Because, and that was my experience as well. You play with the inner child because the inner child is actually fearless. They, they don't go into a state of fear and lack. And when you can just reconnect with that inner child, you look at the world in a very different way. We just think children are completely fearless uh, when they start exploring the world and seeing what's going on around them. And then we, we, we don't give our, ourselves over to fear and to lack and the likes. And then we can come up with solutions or at least look at something from a different perspective. It's not always easy, but it, it helps. Thank you, I'm complete. Monia, did you have something you wanted to say? Oh, no, okay. You're unmuted, I wasn't sure. Um, I have a couple of responses. One, one, actually both from this morning machine project I've been working on. Um, one was just something that one of our collaborators brought up, which was um, compassion versus empathy. And that empathy often um, turns into kind of centering your own ego. And now you're in the thing and then you're actually maybe not helping the other person, but compassion keeps that like fluid pathway um, of connecting and caring. And so she was, she was advocating for us, you know, using the word compassion um, rather than empathy for what we were trying to do. And I really, that was really interesting to me. So that, what you said, remind me of that. The other thing um, I'm just gonna share a part of um, what we're doing. So in Morning Machine, what we're doing is, is it's one big experience, but also there's there's a collection of little experiences. We're calling them machines. And the idea of machine is as apparatus that it takes input, transforms it into output. And so there are these interactive experiences um, and they're kind of all scattered around the space and you can kind of choose it at your will. And one of our machines we call, um, clowns and coffins and we got it from our one of our collaborators who is a clown um more more theatrical clown than than you know red nose or anything like that he's he's, he's um much more emotive with the face and the body um in that kind of way um and he gave us this exercise which which we've now turned into a machine and people loved it where there's a coffin and there's chairs kind of set up like a, fu like a funeral parlor style. Um, 
and a group of us are in the back and, and in this particular space we actually had a window we could look through and look into the space and see this and the assignment was one at a time a person we you have a task you go in you sit down you stand up you whisper something into the coffin and you come back and that's it simple task so someone would go do it and when they come back we would give them observations about their physical body. Oh, I noticed that your right shoulder twitched a little bit when you sat down. And, and when you bent over to whisper the coffin, you were really at an angle. And when you walked back, you were a lot faster than when you walked in and you were looking up or down or something, right? So then the assignment is, okay, do it again. But those things that we pointed out, you have to make bigger and exaggerate. So then you're going in, you're, you know, twitching your shoulder and you're very angled and, and, and then you come back and you get another set of feedback and you do it a third time. And by the third time, it's become this like physical theater, comedy clown routine, um, because you've become this caricature of the thing that you were already naturally doing. And then we would come back and have a conversation about it, about, well, what did that feel like for you? And what did that evoke for the other people who are watching? You know, oh, you became very old or it made me think about this experience of being in a funeral. But our whole idea is, well, it's twofold. One idea is, you know, for weddings and other things, you get to practice. You get to, you have the rehearsal dinner, or you walk down the aisle, you do all the things. But for funerals, there's no place to practice. Um, and so this is, so one idea is like, this is the rehearsal, right? Like you get to practice the action, but the other thing, what you were saying, Hanali is about, is about the, the distancing, right? When you make it so comedic and, and kind of step away from that, like emotional density a bit and ab abstraction, you actually have more access into what it's really about. And hopefully you feel now you might go into the situation and feel more comfortable. And I mean, you know, we were laughing yesterday about, you know, we'll really know our project is, is, is going well if we hear a story about someone who did the, the, the clown routine at an actual funeral. But, um, but even so, like, if you're more, com you're more comfortable with that environment, you're more comfortable being in that space, you're, you're more aware of what your body does and what it's, what it's indicating. And hopefully it makes it easier to approach these situations in the future. Um, but it's definitely, if nothing else, a conversation entry point and, a, and that stepping back and be able to look at it. So um, that's my one, one, sh one of the machines that we're working on. And, and it felt everything you were saying, Hanali felt it was like exactly about that. So I wanted to share. Uh, Beatrice, I'm wondering, have you ever read Arnold Mindel? M-I-N-D-E-L-L, -L, uh, because what you described now, he describes it as a secondary, your dream body. So you, when you in, exaggerate movements you are not aware of, uh, or others can see, uh, you finally, uh, yeah, you give a body to your dream body. So that's, and uh, that's a very, uh, maybe you just have a look at him, Arnold Mindel, he has, has lots of books, so it's, yeah. I just looked him up and it's interesting because my, um, th my therapist, I asked her once because she has such a strange way of doing therapy and, um, I said, what is your modality? Because it's I'm it's nothing I'm familiar with from the past, you know, it's not cognitive behavioral or any dialectical or whatever. And she said it's process-oriented psychology. And just now I looked up Arnold Mendel and that's that's his thing. So that, yeah, I'm gonna definitely look into that. Yeah, it's a totally different um approach to yes. the convention. Mm -hmm. Girls, ladies. <laughs> I have to leave. Um, yeah, start with the checkout. So I'm looking forward to. Well, what's the opposite of change? Static. Stability. Stability. No. Uh, oh, I'm... you mean like like stagnation? <laughs> Homeostasis. 
homeostasis. That sounds terrible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, maybe we just, yeah, maybe we just try to imagine what would happen if there was no change for our next topic. Mm -hmm. And then we will be very glad that there is change, I, I guess. <laughs> okay, thank you. It was a pleasure. To whom do you give? Hmm? To who do you give to the tech art? To? I pass it on to you, Heidi. Oh, okay, <laughs> I check out before everybody else. And I still feel like needing to be the last. So I'm the, the second today. No, I find it very, very important, this topic, because it's so much um, part of our present in, in, in life no, and in, in the world. So came very nice uh, you you contributed nice aspects i like it and i definitely will look into process oriented psychology it sounds interesting i give over to hanely thank you heidi oh yeah thank you monja for reminding me of arnold i love his work i've got many of his books i 20 years ago i was really into lots of his work at the time and I really appreciate you naming it again. Thank you for that. Yeah, I also loved everybody who contributed, everybody, you all contributed such amazing things and yeah, it's yeah, it's just wonderful. I was, as a child, we moved a lot, so I was always it was easy for me to go to a different environment, a new school and things like that. And so I'm grateful for that experience as a child that we could also you know, experience different things. I think it contribute to my ability to adapt quickly and to go with the flow rather than to resist much. And um, yes, I'm looking forward to the next one. Uh, Monia, I love that one. What would happen if there's no change? I would die. <laughs> and I'll pass on to Victoria. <laughs> Thank you, Hanali. Um Yeah, it's. I, I think it's a really interesting point because I think it's, I, I do believe that baby statement that, <laughs> but not all babies is true. Beatrice pointed that out. Um, I, yeah, I think it, I think it's interesting to look at both extremes and then see, see what comes out in the middle. Um, but I really, I really, yeah, I really enjoyed all the things. I appreciate all the things that were shared today because it, it's all um, fitting into my big, whatever, Weltanschauung um, that I'm working on. <laughs> I don't know why I'm doing it, but it's there's some kind of I'm being driven in some direction. So um, we'll see what happens. But I look forward to next time. Thank you. I'll pass to Beatrice. Thank you. It's always a delight. <laughs> um, I really love this group. I'm so glad to be a part of it. And yeah, I can't wait to see what we come up with next time. Um, I'll be in Portland then. So. It's talking about change. <laughs> Got a lot of change of environment lately. <laughs> so thank you. Looking forward to seeing you all next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.